you can find me on Twitter at JPN Tech. So um, in general, I, I like to call myself a generalized nerd. Um, I work deep within open source and PKI, public key infrastructure, and have for the last six years. Um, so this is a picture of me and my cat, foster cat. <laughs> I was like, cat people stay together. Um, this is Bosley, um, and he got, um, he got adopted, but I just really love that cat. He's really sweet. Um, so my credentials. Um, I've been around a while, but I'm not super old. Thank you very much. I started my journey in a tech startup called CoreOS. Um, that was later acquired by Red Hat, and I spent um, a year and a half at Red Hat. So CoreOS, uh, like every other you know, infrastructure startup at its time, was open source and product was open core. Um, I did nonprofit tech for about five years. I promise that's actually a thing. Um, EFF is here. Um, Free Software Foundation is here, though they're both great nonprofit tech. I work closely with EFF at a thing called Internet Security Research Group, and they are the, the organization, the 501c3 behind Let's Encrypt, which is the largest certificate authority. So whenever you go and get TLS, a huge amount of them use Let's Encrypt certificates um, on the web. I'm still in public key infrastructure at Small Step, um, just like 10 years ago, the, um, the startup I was in, we are open source. Um, whoops, as I'm going to have to keep this going. Um, we are open source with open core. Um, I'm by no means an expert in this. I've just been around for this place for the last decade. Um, and I just want to see people succeed. Um, and, you know, and I have also worked along, alongside a lot of maintainers, especially within PKI. PKI is hard to use. There's been a lot of tooling and things around, um, open source tooling around PKI. And so I've worked with just a ton of maintainers over the last decade. Um, there we go. So what are we talking about for the next 10 minutes? Sustainable open source and the typical or not so typical ways it can be done. So you have an open source project. You're at your first 50 or 100 users that hopefully you can identify through things like Orbit or uh, working with amazing analysts, stuff like that. Um, so you're, you have an open source project and you're like, now what? Um, I'm hoping you're asking the now what when you open source it, but maybe you aren't. So you can do it in your free time. If you can make it into a full-time job, alternative funding sources, you can read that list. Um, and the one thing that binds all of these ways. So when we talk about free time, doing an open source project in your free time, this is what a lot of people do when they first open source or you know, start a project. Um, that could be people in this room. That's probably a lot of people here at this conference. Um, a lot of maintainers open source something that they found super handy in their own work. So it could be something that they found handy you know, for their work environments, for their home lab, whatever. Um, a ridiculous amount of companies use open source software. I read a statistic that was like 99%. I'm not making that up. And any statistic that says 99%, I immediately um, just disqualify, but it's, it's a lot regardless. Um, so the good thing about doing open source in your free time, um, you get what you get to do with your project what you want. It stays truly open source as long as you want it to be truly open source. The bad is that it's time consuming, tiring, and can be a lot of work with the moderation, the actual working with your community. Um, and the maintainers and contributors as well. You can have alternative funding sources. So we're talking the Patreons, the GoFundMes, the Buy Me Coffee, the GitHub sponsorships. Um, there's even grants out there for individuals who want to be doing work um, within open source and within their projects. So governments, foundations, um, Prosimo that I also worked on and helped start um, is a memory safety initiative that if you have something that hits memory safety, a ridiculous amount of bugs in, um, for example, Android come from memory safe, uh, memory on safe languages. So just, you know, rewriting things in, for example, Rust. Um, so there are lots of places out there that, that do have like those one-time grants um, that you can get even just as an independent contributor. So the good about this is that there's slightly more financial stability than just doing it in your free time. You're able to keep the autonomy of the project as well. The bad is that now there's financial stakeholders. Um, and that can be a ton of work. So being really clear with your financial stakeholders, whether it's a Patreon, whether it is government um, grants, which actually take a little bit more oversight um, and reporting, um, just making sure that those financial stakeholders know that 
they're donating, right? Instead of like they're having a say now in your project. Um, it may not be sustainable month over month, much less year over year. So this isn't necessarily a sustainable way to make a living at your open source project. Full-time job. So this can be actually be really, really cool. I've seen a lot of open source maintainers make their project into a full-time job while, re while having the autonomy of their open source project. So you can find one of those companies that uses your open source project, you can find lots of those companies and pitch them. I want to work on this full time and I know that this is an important part of your infrastructure, this is an important part of your app, whatever have you at these companies. I want you to pay me to do it full time. Um, the good thing about this is that it's much more financially maintained. You have some free time again, which is really nice. Um, your end game could be selling the project to the company someday. If that's what, if you're like, I want to be done with this, I want to wash my hands of this project, I've been doing this for 15 years, um, that could be your end goal. So the bad is that the company might want to own the project right off the bat. Again, having those clear communications with folks as you're pitching them can really help you know, not have that stress in, in those conversations. Um, it's no longer a passion project. You have to do it um, when it's your full-time job. Uh, if you do end up selling the project, we all know that the free and open source community may hate you forever. Um, so if that's your end goal and, you know, coming into a company, being paid to work on your open source project, eventually selling the open source project kind of gets a, can get a black mark on your, on your name kind of a thing. Um, you can participate in an incubator or maintainer program. So you have a project that's super important to a community, to a company. Um, the Linux Foundation or CNCF, so if it's in that cloud native world, you can do CNCF. Um, there's one called the Open Source Collective. So I don't know, I, I do mutual aid in my free time. So um, we use Open Collective for you know, being really transparent with all, of our, um, with all of our funds and where they're going. Open Source Collective uses Open Collective to do that exact same thing within open source. So you can go be a part of Open Source Collective. They have their monthly calls and that kind of stuff. Um, the good is that it's probably going to be open source forever and there's already a natural community around it. You know, the Open Source Collective has a great community around it. CNCF, I'm pretty sure we've all seen that landscape. It's huge. <laughs> um, they have a really great community around them as well. And your project continues to grow even without you on it um, or on it on the sidelines. So the bad is there's potentially less autonomy. Um, and honestly, sometimes when you donate your project or send it to an incubator, you could be sending it to the graveyard. <laughs> um, so maybe the incubator or the maintaining organization isn't doing with it what you thought they would. Um, and they're not growing it and it becomes you know, kind of null and void. Um, and that's hard for a lot of people because you put a lot of time and energy into them. You can create a nonprofit. <laughs> this is what we did with Let's Encrypt. Um, either a project has to be for the public good with this. It has to be for a greater good um, to really like succeed as a nonprofit. Um, you can, again, finding those large enterprise users and getting them to donate is a super great way um, to be financially stable with that. But you always have to think through to the end goal. If I create a nonprofit out of my open source project, what, it, what do I want to do with it? Do I want to maintain it as an open source project? Um, and as a nonprofit until the end of time, until it's not, uh, no longer needed? Is this just to get me through the next five years? Always think about your end goal um, and really what you want, where you want to see the project going. Um, so the good, the autonomy again, um, it's always great having the user and public good in mind. I think a lot of us in open source have that in mind when we create things. And then just solidifying that with um, a nonprofit is really cool. Um, companies love this because they can either write you a check as a business expense <laughs> or as a charity, so as a 501c3 in the US. It's easy to write a check for that kind of stuff. Um, the bad is that you've started a nonprofit. Um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> turns out. It's a lot of work. Um, and it's not recession proof. So, what you know, we're going into a recession right now. One of the first things that we're seeing is folks not able um, to write those checks to nonprofits. Um, even if they want to. Um, they're spending freezes, things like that. So definitely not recession proof at all. And then let's say you don't want to do any of those things. You do what I've done or helped do twice now and you want to start a company. Um, so you make a SaaS offering. Um, you know, you want to make something that people can come and easily use, but maybe that has a few more features 
than your current open source offerings, so you have a SaaS offering. Um, I'll get to the bad of that in a second. Um, you could go professional services or support or training route. You know, we see that with Red Hat. Um, they, they have a great professional so services team if you're using it in big ways, if you're using something that's, you know, gone to their graveyard um, and you still need support on it, they still support it, legacy support, things like that. Um, again, thinking through the end goal. Always look towards the end goal with your project. Am I starting a company just to sell it someday? That's a great question. Um, the good is that you started a company. It's easy to find investors if the project has a lot of momentum. That first, that seed, that series A, you don't necessarily need to be showing revenue. You just need to be showing momentum. And so it's a lot, it's, it's, it's fairly easy if you already have that momentum going within your first 50 or 100 really community supporters to, to actually create a company from that. Um, it's fairly financially stable. You know, you know, I have to raise this amount of money, I have this amount of runway, you're pretty, pretty good off. The bad is that you've started a company, same as you started a nonprofit. It's hard, it's a lot of work. Um, you have investors to report to. So you have these folks who are financially invested in it. A lot of the times those investors also sit on your board, maybe not in seed in series A, um, but you still have somebody who's given you money and is expecting money back, right? You still have to be, you're financially bound to someone. Um, product is really hard, turns out. Um, creating a product that is easy for a lot of people to use, that is ubiquitous within the community, but that also starts from open source that somebody would be willing to pay for. It's a lot of work. Um, and then getting back to that, like, what goes into open source and what goes into paid. You're always, you're always making somebody upset, right? Like, oh, I want to pull this thing, you know, I want to do this thing, but I don't want to do it in open source because I feel like it's something, something someone can pay me for. Um, and that upsets the open source community because maybe they needed that functionality within your project. Um, and that's that. But what about community? This talk was supposed to be all about community. Well, it was in each of those things, right? Did you catch them in each of it? It may not be the way that we think about community normally, you know, when we think about contributors and maintainers. Community is so much more. Um, setting up Google Alerts for your project, for example. Um, reaching out to folks who are talking about your project externally. Reaching out to folks who are talking about projects that bump up to you or maybe compete with you, talking about why they went to that project um, and why they chose, you know, that project over yours. Um, talking to people at large companies who, you know, work in open source, um, product folks, all those, all those people are really important. Even if you're, you know, talking to investors is super awesome. There's a couple of great VCs out there that fund open source, um, you know, as they start a company that, you know, even if you're like, I don't know what I want to do with this, it's still great to know those people and to get their insight. So every single place, Everything that you want to do still all comes back to community, and it's not just about the maintainers and the contributors. Um, and lastly, be genuine. With all of these people and with all of these interactions, be genuinely yourself with your community and the people that you're working with, whatever you decide to do with your open source project. Um, communication is a big part of community. So we have an incredible amount of burnout within the open source community. You know, we, we have this like hail to, you know, like big companies come in and say, hey, open source maintainers, we hear you and we're there with you. And then they go about their business the other 11 months of the year, right? And, and so there is a lot of burnout within open source. Um, straight up, if you're put to the point of burnout with your open source project, project Breakage happens. There's a saying in open source that you don't know who's using your project until something breaks. <laughs> um, and then everybody is like, why did this break? And then all of a sudden you know your users, right? Um, and breakage happens. I'm not suggesting you go out and break something on purpose, but if you're burned out, if you're unable to maintain your open source project the way it needs to be maintained and breakage happens, sometimes that's a rally cry and we have to embrace those moments as well. Um, we are all humans. 
We are humans together. We are humans with an open source. Um, so we're here to build each other and so build each other up and support each other, no matter what kind of a thing. Um, and so again, just like having those communications, using all those communication communication routes to maintain telling folks when you're getting to the point of burnout of, I don't know if I can maintain this project anymore, I need help with this. Having those open forms of communication and being vulnerable and transparent with our projects is huge. Okay, so that was a lot, there is a lot of other stuff in this, but I only had a few minutes. <laughs> um, so if you wanna talk more about it, I, you know, I love talking about sustainable open source and what makes a project sustainable and how to sustain it. Um, there's a lot of nuances even within each of these um, and, and even more outside of it. So if you want to talk more about it, I'm JP and Tech on Twitter. Um, feel free to DM me. I'm always up for coffee or virtual coffee. Um, and I'll post these slides here as well, um, as well as my speaker notes so you can kind of see a little bit more of the thought process behind all of them um, moving forward. <laughs>